Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at earthquakes and the Earth's interior. So in this video we're going to focus on how do earthquake waves travel and this is going to correspond to section 12.5 of your textbook. Now, we know that the vast majority of earthquake activity is going to be related to fault movement. And of course, we know that earthquakes are the result of stick-slip behavior, which is displayed by faults. So obviously, stick-slip behavior, once again, just to go back over it, means that uh, the fault will move and then it will lock up. So the movement of the fault is the slip and the locking up of the fault is the stick. So once the fault locks up, you will have two blocks of rock that want to move past each other, but they can't because of friction. So we know that whilst the fault is locked, the amount of seismic energy being imparted into that, into those blocks of rocks is steadily increasing because the fault wants to move. There's a pushing or pulling force that wants to try and make these blocks move past each other, but they can't. And so this energy is being imparted into these blocks, but it can't be used for anything because friction is stopping the movement. Now, eventually, the amount of strain will build up to such a point that the stored energy will be sufficient to overcome friction. Now, this will allow the blocks of rock to move past each other. So when the earthquake occurs, a lot of the stored energy gets turned into mechanical energy. And it's, it's this mechanical energy that allows the pieces of rock to move and slip past one another. However, not all the energy will be turned into mechanical energy. Some of it will actually be turned into vibrations, or for a better way of describing it, pressure waves and these are referred to as seismic waves. Now these seismic waves will travel away from the location of the earthquake in all directions so they'll go up down and laterally as well. Now when we feel an earthquake we are actually feeling these seismic waves these pressure waves that have been produced due to the fault movement. So the first thing we need to deal with is how do we actually split up seismic waves? Well seismic waves fall into two broad groups. The first group is referred to as surface waves, and as the name suggests, these waves move exclusively across the Earth's surface. So they're just limited to the outer layer of the Earth's crust. They don't go down into the Earth's interior, they just move across the surface of the Earth. Now there's two types of surface waves. There's Raleigh waves and there's Love waves. And you'll notice that they affect the ground in different ways. Now, in the case of Raleigh waves, they help to allow the ground to move almost like a fluid, so like water. Now, as the wave passes through, what you can see is they're causing the ground to essentially flow. They're causing portions of it to rise up and portions of it to go down, forming peaks and troughs. So the passage of a Raleigh wave will cause the vertical surface to rise up and down. So it's going to cause your ground level to go up and down and up and down. Now, in the case of a love wave, you can see once again, it's moving from the left towards the right. But in this instance, unlike the Raleigh waves, which causes the ground to go up and down, the love wave is shearing as it moves through the rock and it's causing the ground to move left to right. So it's causing lateral movement instead. So when you feel an earthquake, what you're actually detecting is the passage of Raleigh waves and love waves across the surface of the earth. Now, this means that because Raleigh waves and love waves are moving across the surface of the earth, they are often the most damaging types of seismic waves because these are the waves that will cause the ground to move. And this ground movement can lead to things like building collapses, bridge collapses, people falling over and hurting themselves, gas lines breaking, those kinds of problems. Now, the other type of waves are referred to as body waves, and they're called body waves because they move through the body of the Earth. They aren't just limited to the Earth's surface, they will travel all the way through the Earth's interior. Now, body waves are split into two groups. There are primary body waves, which are referred to as P waves, and there are secondary body waves, which are referred to as S waves. Now, these two waves have different properties, and it's these different properties that are most helpful to geologists. Now, in the case of P waves, they have the capacity to move through solids, liquids, and even gases. Not particularly effectively, but they can move through gas as well. But it's their ability to move through solids and liquids which are most important to geologists. Now, in the case of S waves, they can only move through solids. They cannot go through liquids or gases. And this is a very important point that you must remember. 
Now, in the case of P waves, it is a compressional wave. So as we can see in this case, we can see our wave is moving from the left to the right. Now, each of these cubes um, essentially represents what's happening to our rock. So the wave is compressional. So as it passes through, you can see it's causing portions of our rock here to become compressed. It's literally pushing the atoms towards each other. And then obviously, once the atoms move towards each other, they start to repel, repel each other, and they push each other away. And so it's by this uh, movement towards the next atom and then the repulsion of that atom that you allow the wave to move through your block of rock. So think of it a bit like having a row of people standing uh, in front of each other and then let's say you have a defensive tackle run into them at full speed. Well obviously when the football player hits the first person in the row that person is then going to bang into the second person so the energy has been passed along. That second person is then going to bang into the third person. The third person then bangs into the fourth person and so on. So the energy of the initial impact gets passed along the row of people. Now, once person one has fallen over, they stand back up and they return to their original position. Same with person two, person three, person four. So the energy gets passed along and then the people return to their starting position. And exactly the same thing happens to the atoms in our piece of rock. They get pushed towards each other, so they interact with each other. And then what happens is they then move back to their original position. And then essentially you have a cascade situation where the energy is getting passed between adjacent atoms. And so this helps to explain why P waves can move through solids very effectively and very quickly. Now, in terms of liquids, we know that the molecules that make up liquids aren't connected to one another, and so they can move freely relative to each other. However, P waves can move through liquids because as the P wave moves through the liquid, it hits the first molecule, let's say of water. So it hits the first water molecule, and this pushes the water molecule towards another water molecule. And as the water molecule begins to interact with the second water molecule, it begins to repel it, and that pushes the second water molecule away. Now, the second water molecule will then move, and then it will come close to a third water molecule. And once again, as the second water molecule moves closer to the third water molecule, it will begin to repel it, and that will push the third water molecule away. The third water molecule interacts with a fourth, the fourth with the fifth, the fifth with the sixth, etc. And so you can see how, once again, the energy is being passed between the molecules in our liquid. So the fact that P waves can travel through solids and liquids is extremely helpful to geologists in terms of trying to work out what the physical properties of a layer of rock are. Now, in the case of secondary waves, it shears material. So you can see it's causing the material to come up and down a little bit like a Riley wave, but not in quite the same way. Now, as you can see, it's causing the, the, the block of rock to deform. You can see the sinusoidal pattern here. Now, the thing about secondary waves is that if in order for energy to be transferred from one atom to the next, you need the atoms to be bonded to each other. So once again, let's go back to our water molecule. So let's say an S wave comes into some water. Well, the S wave hits the first water molecule. The first water molecule goes up and nothing happens because the water molecule isn't moving towards any other water molecule so it's not actually passing the energy along all that's happening is that our first water molecule is going up and down and that's it the s wave can't go any further so if the s wave is going to continue the atoms must be bonded to each other in a solid lattice that means that as the first atom goes up the second atom gets pulled down as the second atom gets pulled down the third atom goes up as the third atom goes up the fourth atom goes down so it's the fact that these atoms are connected to each other that allows the s wave to pass through our block of rock and so we have to have solid bonds between our atoms. So secondary waves can only pass through solids. So if you want to think of a, a way of thinking about S waves, imagine you have a piece of string and you attach that piece of string to, or attach one end of the piece of string to a nail and you nail it into a wall so that your piece of string is now attached to the wall. You have the other end and you start flicking the piece of string up and down. So you can see the waves moving along the piece of string. Now, because you're connected using the piece of string, you can pass the wave along the string and it will go from your hand all the way down the piece of string to the wall. Now, let's just say that you have a friend and your friend happens to be standing there and they have a pair of scissors and they decide just to be annoying that they're going to cut the piece of string. 
well, what's going to happen? As soon as the piece of string gets cut, your ability to pass the seismic wave down the piece of string is stopped, isn't it? Because it's no longer connected. There's no longer a solid connection along the entire length of the piece of string. So it's the fact that you have this solid connection that makes S-wave propagation possible. As soon as you don't have atoms firmly attached to each other, an S-wave cannot pass between them. So always bear this in mind. P waves can move through solids and liquids. S waves can only move through solids. Another factor is that P waves being compressional are much more efficient. So they can move a lot faster than S waves can. So how do we actually record, how do we actually record earthquake events, seismic waves? Well, this is probably what you've seen in the movies. So this is a basic seismometer, and this is the tool that we use to actually measure and monitor earthquake activity. Now, a seismometer, as you can see in this case, consists of a relatively simple device. We have a, an arm here, which is uh, thoroughly attached to either the ground or the table. Uh, we have a drum, which, has, which is covered in paper. And then we have a pendulum uh, uh, at the end of which is a pen, essentially. Now, as an earthquake passes through, it's obviously going to cause the ground to shake or the table to shake, and this is going to cause the pendulum to swing. Obviously, the more energy, the bigger the swing will be. And so as the earthquake passes through, it causes the pendulum to swing from side to side, and obviously the pen draws the seismogram onto the piece of paper. And this is what a seismogram looks like. And so if you look over here, you can see we have nothing going on. So this is our background activity. And then you can see this is the first seismic wave hitting right here. And you can see the sudden increase in activity, which continues for the next 25 minutes or so. So this essentially is showing you the, the process which is going on as the seismic waves pass through the seismometer. Now, modern seismometers are a little bit more different. So as you can see in this case, they are in the ground as opposed to being attached to the ground or on a table or something like that. They have a power supply that keeps them working and they also have a radio antenna that allows the data to be relayed to a central location. Now, in terms of modern seismometers, they work a little bit more like a piston. So as the, um, as the wave passes through, it causes the piston inside to rise and fall. And it's this rising and falling of the piston, which essentially gets converted into a seismogram. But nevertheless, a basic seismometer or a modern seismometer will produce seismograms. And it's seismograms that we use to say, right, an earthquake has occurred, and we use seismograms to work out where it's occurred and how strong it was. So there's lots of important information associated with seismograms. So when we look at a seismogram, what do we see? Well, typically, you will get a seismogram in four stages. So the first stage over here is simply the background. So this is going to be your normal, everyday seismic activity. And you'll notice it's not a flat line because seismic activity, can, seismic waves can be produced by a number from a number of different sources. A person walking along will produce pressure waves, which could be detected by a seismometer. You know, a car driving past a building outside will also produce seismic waves that can be detected by a seismometer. So you're always going to have a certain amount of background seismic activity going on just through day-to-day -day processes. Now, when an earthquake occurs, we know that the fastest seismic waves are the P waves, so the primary waves. So they're going to arrive first. And so we can see that all of a sudden we move from our background levels and we see a sudden increase in the size of the seismic wave. So the amplitude has increased. This is telling us there's an earthquake event going on. So our earthquake has started right here. And obviously the P waves being fastest arrive first. So the P waves initially will be their strongest so that the first time the P waves move through, that's when they're going to have, you know, that's when the strongest waves are going to move through. So the amplitude is going to be at its largest. And then as more P waves move through, they're steadily going to be weaker. And so we're seeing the amplitude begin to decrease. Now, after the P waves, the secondary waves will appear because they move slightly more slowly. Now, what you're going to see as the secondary waves move through is once again, you're going to see a sudden increase in amplitude and you're going to steadily see the amplitude decreasing as you get later and later into the passage of the seismic waves. So once again, the first S waves to arrive will tend to be the most energetic, so they'll give you the biggest amplitude. And then later S waves will tend to be a little bit weaker, so the amplitude on the seismogram will be a little lower.
Now, then what will happen is we'll eventually get the slowest waves appearing. These are going to be the surface wave, the Raleigh and Love waves, and then you're going to see them appearing on the seismogram here. So seismograms will often show this particular pattern. And typically, the further your, your seism, uh, your seismometer is from the source of the earthquake, the better split up these will be. Now, we're going to explain why that is in a, in a future presentation, but, uh, but just bear that in mind. Sometimes when you look at a seismogram, to so look at this one here, you can see right there's the earthquake occurring. You can see the big increase in amplitude, and then you can see it's very, very messy. Now, as you, you, can, you can't really discern on this diagram where the P waves are arriving, the S waves are arriving, and the surface waves are arriving. So this would suggest that this particular seismometer was located relatively near the source of the earthquake. Um, and that means that when the seismic waves arrive, because they haven't traveled over a great distance, the P waves, the S waves, and the surface waves are all bunched up together. And so they all arrive at approximately the same time. In contrast, the further, are, the further away you are from a source, the more time the speed difference between the waves has to apply itself. So we know the P waves are moving faster, so they're going to accelerate away. The S waves are moving a bit more slowly, so they're going to take a bit more time. And then finally, the surface waves are moving slowest of all. And so the greater the distance, the more time the P waves have to pull away from the S waves, and the more time the S wave, the more time the S waves have to pull away from the P uh, to pull away from the surface waves. Sorry. And so the greater the distance between the earthquake source and the seismometer, typically the larger the gaps between the arrival of the P waves, the S waves and the surface waves. So this is the kind of seismogram you might expect if you were working at a, a, seism, you know, at a seismic monitoring station, which is quite a good distance from the earthquake source. Now, just got to drive this point home for one, one final time. When we look at seismograms, we will always see that the P waves arrive before the S waves because they are just faster. All right. Thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.